Now, transmediation is becoming incredibly ordinary. Um, we see it, uh, it, it was a, a big component of, of Heroes, um, NBC, where, where uh, Hero himself followed um, what was happening in his life by reading a comic book called Ninth Wonders. Now, Ninth Wonders was a, became an unofficial, official fan site for people to post images and drop little tidbits um, of the story that contributed back to the broader kind of Heroes narrative. We see it also in the Geico Caveman, um, who was a series of short spots um, and then uh, an interactive online environment that uh, if you go and listen to his cell phone, you hear a threatening message, sorry, a, a, a message of support from a guy who's running um, a website called Up With Cavemen that's protesting against the, the depiction of cavemen in the Geico ads. And if you go to that website, you, it looks like an uh, uh, it looks like a, a point for kind of rallying for political action. But it has very minor mentions of Geico. And of course the Geico caveman himself has been spun off into a sitcom, though I hear it's, it's still going through development. Um, unless I get accused of saying it's all blokey, um, what was very, very interesting was LA Diaries, where, uh, which was uh, an, uh, a cross-media, trans-mediated experience. It was an online series, a uh, series of webisodes that ran on Innertube that brought together two characters, one who was leaving uh, or had just left as the world turns and one who was arriving or had just arrived from the young and the restless, or to the young and the restless. And it fit into the narrative of the two soap operas, even though they weren't in any way interlinked, by being a flashback where both of these characters met in LA and what do the notes say? Uh, in order to explain their backstories, um, they were working at a dive bar in Venice Beach, California, where both young women resorted to a life of internet porn in order to make ends meet. Now, what this did was it, it fitted, um, for all intents and purposes, into the narrative of both these programs, even though they were in no way interrelated. But it's a story on its own. I mean, the story of two young blonde starlets getting involved in internet porn in order to make ends meet while living in Venice Beach sounds like a compelling soap opera um, tale to myself. What we also see um, uh, within the, this, this idea of convergence culture and what's significant about, uh, about transmediation is about, it's about the bringing together of new and old media. And we see this transmediation as this kind of top-down example, but we also see it ground up. So the ad busters work um, uh, is, a, is a, a long-standing example of the way in which consumers get involved in this kind of fusing together of media practices. Um, on the right, we have an image from the Bubble Project, which runs in New York, where a guy called G. Lee sticks um, stickers of speech bubbles on advertising and invites people to write their own, their own messages. Um, and the, the little bit of video that's, that's running, and I'll, I'll just turn it down because I'll talk over it, um, is, are two of the videos from the Chevy Tahoe campaign, where Chevy invited um, uh, audiences uh, its consumers to make ads for the Chevy Tahoe, um, providing them with, with images and music and an editing suite on, on Chevy's own site. And of course, many people made ads for the Tahoe, many people used it as an opportunity to comment on you know, ownership of SUVs and, and even Chevy's business practices itself. And so where we get at when we're talking about convergence as a cultural practice are that new and old media are coming together in ways that serve multiple purposes and are often unsurprising and unanticipated. Now, one of the second things to take away from this idea of convergence culture is the notion that the society in which we exist is inherently networked. Um, and people form knowledge communities that are often tactical, so they're often assembled um, for specific purposes and last only a short amount of time. Um, but doing so, they work together in order to solve problems that individually people could not. And so convergence culture, then, is not only defined by transmediation, it's defined also by the coming of collective intelligence or the rise or the, 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 the mainstreaming of collective intelligence. And it's partly because this is, this is the environment in which, in which we, we operate. And this itself was a collaboratively produced map um, about the, the Web 2.0 space. Um, but it's the capacity for consumers to work together across geographic and social distances that is a bit at the heart of Web 2.0 itself. Um, it incorporates and, and embraces, um, and Tim O'Reilly says it offers you know, a resource that can be harnessed, um, you know, the combined energies of a bunch of people. And these combined energies then take on a life that is independent of ideas of consumer power or consumer critique. 
Um, they produce a range of practices that are supported by the entire group, but may have different ends or different aims to it. One of the, uh, the easy examples to look at is something like the alternate reality game that ran with Lost. So Lost sets up an ARG um, and invites people to go on basically a, a massive scavenger hunt across um, physical spaces and across um, a number of branded entertainment spaces. And so people are required to watch a bunch of ads, to look for clues on websites, but also to pile all of this knowledge back together and to work out what the next step they might have to take might be. Now this is something that any one player could probably not achieve, partly due to the time involved, partly due to the range of different competencies that are required. And Henry writes in the book about a bunch of people who get together to spoil Survivor. Um, to find out where Survivor was shot and who the winner was before Survivor gets on TV. And in order to do this, they tap people um, who, for instance, have access to satellite um, navigation um, pho photography, which we can all get now on Google Earth, but also people who have the time to stew through multiple photos of the Pacific Reef to try and work out where it might have been. They tap people who've been on holidays to, to Tahiti and who may have spoken to someone who said, yeah, there were a bunch of American producers here. And basically all of these people who are trying to spoil Survivor get together for their own ends just to try and work out the mystery before Survivor itself takes place. This is this kind of collective intelligence that enables people to achieve goals that no one single consumer and to have experiences that no one single consumer um, could necessarily have on their own. I don't have a pithy picture because it doesn't seem appropriate, but the other example of collective intelligence is um, uh, the anti-globalisation movement, which has really taken on the idea of, of a cell-based organisation so that if any of them are, are, are caught, they honestly don't know what else is going on. So the anti-globalisation protest movement operates along similar lines um, and is a good example, I think, of kind of the, the political ramifications um, or the political activity of these, of these practices. Now, the third thing that happens is we see the emergence of a new form of participatory culture. Um, which is really a contemporary version of folk culture, um, as consumers rework content to serve their personal and collective interests. That's the other reason I start with, started today with this discussion of, of image macros and you know, the idea that reworking content is something that, that you should do um, and can do because it's part of your experience of consuming content itself. And we see this mo most eloquently in fan films, um, some of which are uh, easily as impressive, particularly in the case of, of Revelations, um, which was a Star Wars fan film, easily as impressive as the stuff that's coming out of LucasArts itself. Um, but we also see at the moment is this, is this practice of, um, uh, of re-editing um, uh, video material in order to, to make parody or to make some, some kind of commentary on what's going on. We died in heck! And so this is a cleverly re-edited version of the 300 trailer um, that recut it as if it was a PG-rated film. This is Cake Town! I think what's important to, to understand about all of this is not only is it fun, um, but we're, we're living in an environment where audiences no longer need to rely on auxiliary media forms. I actually really quite like this. And we will hug in the shade. So what's significant about that is, that is that we live in an environment where that sort of stuff is available because the tools for production um, uh, have been democratised for all intents and purposes. And what this does is it changes the way that we need to think about um, who consumers are and even who the audience is. I won't give too much away because I want to talk about this a little bit, a little bit later, but you know, we're, dealing, we're now living in an environment where consumers don't need to write a letter in order to make a statement about a film they've just seen. They can actually get the film and recut it. And one of the famous examples of this is the No Jar Jar Binks edit that was done of the, um, the first Star Wars prequel. Um, and we see, in, because of this, an uneasy relationship um, and a, an oscillating relationship that has developed where some media producers are happy for this to happen and some not so. Because what this practice brings up, and, and indeed most of the practices of, of convergence culture raise, are a changing experience of control, of expectations of control, particularly over what consumers will do, about how they will relate to your content, about how your content can be 
treated. And we're in an environment where we have kind of on the one hand companies who want to prohibit this, people like the RAAA. And on the other hand, we have companies who are more interested in kind of um, collaborating with consumers. And the lead cases here are really uh, games producers. What this does is change <coughs> the way that we think about what consumers are themselves and also what is legitimate cultural practice. And that's what's significant, I think, about the democratisation of tools. Um, I can't help but believe that we're in an environment where we are shocked that people would want to recut films only because this seems to be the first time that many, many, many people have been able to do it. And the other thing that comes out of this um, uh, is the idea that participation in a media event or a, a media property may not necessarily run to just watching the property itself. So the example I like to raise here is Snakes on a Plane. So Snakes on a Plane was a reasonably ordinary B-grade film. Right? This is the kind of thing um, that maybe Ice Cube would appear in or LL Cool J. You'd watch it on Sci-Fi Network just after Anaconda or Anaconda 2. Um, <laughs> And between, there's one about like a velociraptor coming in, take, it's like Carnosaur or something. Uh, I see it all the time when I'm home and it's Carnosaur 3. I'm not quite sure what happened to Carnosaur 1 and 2, but Carnosaur 3 makes no sense. It's just people enjoying. Anyway, um, so that's what Snakes on a Plane was. Until the internet's picked up on it and went, holy crap, Snakes on a Plane sounds hilarious. This was an opportunity for Snakes on a Plane producers because they got a taste or a sense of who the potential audience for Snakes on a Plane might have been. Or rather, they got a look at who the potential audience for Snakes on a Plane really was. And they made a very, very wise decision. First of all, they decided not to prosecute anyone who was screwing around with Snakes on a Plane. Um, you know, and they worked with, the, they, they made offers for the community to make their own trailers and promotional materials. But they went and they decided not to make a PG rated film. And this is important because Snakes on a Plane can only suck more if it doesn't have the thing that it needs, mainly blood, guts and gore and a bit of swearing, um, in order you know, for, it, for it to be something other than a bad B-grade film. So they went back into production. They got people back, this was months after it had closed, they got all the actors back, including Samuel L. Jackson, um, in order to reshoot the film so that they could have an R-rated cut, in order to play to the audience who, was, uh, who was, you know, had bubbled up on the internet. Um, and, of course, the important thing was that they got Samuel L. Jackson to say, I'm sick of these motherfucking snakes on this motherfucking plane. <laughs> now, where the narrative gets interesting, however, is in the post-mortem, where Snakes on a Plane wasn't the blockbusting success that some people were saying that it was. It was a reasonably successful B-grade film. And so people were suddenly decrying all of this as just some sort of rubbish internet hype. You know, and people like uh, people who speak from the position that Andrew Keane speaks from come out and say, you know, see, the internet's full of idiots, it doesn't account to anything, it's just people playing. Ultimately, that's true. If you think that Snakes on a Plane was ever going to be anything other than a B-grade film, but also if you think that Snakes on a Plane is only a B-grade film and all of this was some kind of promotional campaign. What happened when the internet took over Snakes on a Plane um, was that Snakes on a Plane became an experience commodity. So, as an experience commodity, Snakes on a Plane was incredibly successful. It got a bunch of people involved months before the, the, the film aired. It got a, a, a truckload of buzz generated. It, sell, it sold auxiliary products. It advertised the film in ways, got the film out to an audience um, or, or to a, a public who probably wouldn't have paid it much interest. Granted, it didn't pay off necessarily in blockbuster success, but... It also returned rents prior to the event that Snakes on a Plane was never going to return in terms of, uh, of advertising revenue, in terms of branded property sales. And the real truth, or the real something in the pudding, I think, will be about what happens to Snakes on a Plane along the long tail. Because Snakes on a Plane was always the film, it was always the sort of film that was going to sell more through, you know, $4 chuck-out DVD sales than it was as a blockbuster hit. And so I think that when we think about Snakes on a Plane fundamentally as a film... Yes, it was a failure, perhaps. When we think about it as an experience event, we start to understand the way that participation within the media changes the way we need to think about what media properties themselves might be. The fact that we can't quite capitalise on that yet, that we can't quite turn back massive profits, I think is just um, a, a problem waiting for a solution. Or I think the solution's yet to come to that question. But I'll get to that in just a little minute because the final point I want to make is that 
the final characteristic of convergence culture is that we're living in an environment where we acquire skills through play and recreational lives that we apply to more serious ends. And this is where we get wonderful phrases like Photoshop for democracy um, or the CNN YouTube debate. Um, you know, and so, so YouTube says there are a bunch of people who know how to make videos. There are a bunch of people who are talking on YouTube. Let's get them involved in the political process. Um, now, it wasn't necessarily the, the, the blockbusting success that it could have been, but the other thing I want to just, just sort of raise is the idea of the Harry Potter Alliance. So the Harry Potter Alliance are a bunch of fans of Harry Potter who uh, decided to try and capitalise on um, their own connectivity, on their own critical mass, in order to make the world a better place. So they have aid campaigns going um, to try and do something about the situation in Darfur, for instance. And so here we have the kind of connections that emerge out of entertainment properties and out of fandom being mobilised for political purposes. So, that's kind of broadly and quite quickly, I realise, um, some of the undergirding principles of convergence culture. And I want to take the next kind of five to ten minutes to talk through the way in which um, uh, it's altered the media landscape uh, for the better, but also the way in which it lays out some kind of new future that we need to navigate through. And I'd like to do so by going back to my youth. When I was a lad growing up in Australia, um, TDK ran this series of ads um, called Evolve to TDK. This was in the late 1990s. Um, and the, the, there's a still on the top there of the TV spot. And it was a little bit violent. It was a, it was a guy evolving through from being a human to a kind of post-human experience um, brought about by TDK. And we can see down the bottom that the condition of evolving to TDK um, means getting square eyes. I'm not quite sure how square eyes help you, but my mum told me I'd always get them if I watch too much telly. Um, but it involves getting square eyes and larger ears. All right? This, I think, is this old idea of the way that people relate to media technologies and the way that... Um, that uh, we relate to technology uh, more generally. I think the, we, we are in an environment now where consumers are more likely to act upon media properties than to be acted upon it. And that's one of the first things that we need to understand if we're going to try and work out a path to go forward. Um, <laughs>